Okay, um, last time I did a lecture, it wasn't really a lecture, it was just going over one of the games, and mostly what I do is just do a lot of simultaneous exhibitions, so this is also quite unusual for me. However, I can recall an episode um, when I was like uh, 10 or 9 years old, and there was a Karpov Kaspar World Championship match in progress in Leningrad, and I was just an upcoming uh, talented kid, and the, one of the uh, journalists in the press center, he noticed that all the countries that were going out for lunch and they uh, said, okay, you're a young kid, why don't you go out uh, to the board and try to come into the current game? And I had to do it in English also, so <laughs> I was around 10, so I thought, okay, that was an interesting experience. Uh, I haven't done much since then, but uh, today, um, because we're here at the ACP Classics, um, I thought it was, um, how to say this, um, Relevant uh, to go back to one of my uh, World Championship games uh, in '96 against Anatoly Karpov. We played the match with the Germans, and um, what I'm going to show you is the game where we had actually had a German uh, which came out to be almost uh, decisive in our match. So, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to you know ask me at any time, and uh, we are going to start. Them. Okay. I'm going to show you th uh, the game was the uh, 13th game of the match. Anatoly was winning uh, with a score of plus 3. He basically killed me in the first uh, 7 games or 8 games because I had absolutely no experience and he had this huge match experience. And he tried to... He, he did a good job killing me. Okay, so in this game I'm playing black. And we continue our discussion in the uh, Queen's Indian. Uh, Some of you will probably recognize the lines. And Did you say the number of the game, Tata? Uh, it was the 13th game. OK, so basically this was a, a topical theory back in the day. The idea is um, to hinder, of course, the wise development. So and the standard Catalan fashion white plays this and black goes back to his second So normal development. And of course, I like to play slot defense, so Queen's Indian in this line is very similar to slot defense. And of course that's the key point. White has to do, uh, develop something on C3. And usually it was a bishop, because then knight goes to D2, and bishop is back on the diagonal. So and the knight five idea is basically to try to, you know, because black is going to develop on d7 anyway, and this knight will have no squares. The idea is to hinder the development of that knight and open the bishop first. So, knight d7, take, take. Here we came up with the novel idea at the time. That is, I played this one. Usually the main line went like this, c8, and the other main lines they included b5. So the idea behind this walk was that um, in many lines, after black plays b5, white allows to take on c4, then the rook is here sitting doing nothing. And for the rook b8, it makes more sense to be on the open line also prepare something like bishop e4, because this bishop uh, controls a lot of dark squares. So after eliminating this um, bishop, white will, black will have an opportunity to develop his queen on the dark squares also. So that was the idea behind rook e8. And I remember Anatoly was thinking for a long time, and of course he's a very cautious player. So he was thinking what to do. And uh, he just simply decided to move the bishop back out of the way. And uh, prepare, of course, for a C-line invasion. So I had to play B5 once I played with B8. And he closed the center. So it um, doesn't make sense to play before here, because after A3, it will open, then the weakness on A7 will happen. So black had to follow up with B5. 
And of course, now we have a strategic uh, position. White has to take, otherwise there's no sense in doing anything. We have an interesting strategic position here. Um, on one hand, we have this um, double pawns. But of course, since the pawns is in the center, it controls all the squares, so it's really important. White has a uh, nice development, bishops on the main diagonals. Uh, black's bishop on e6 is kind of dumb, but bishop on e7 is nice. So, um, in terms of space in the center, as you know, you know, fighting for the center is one of the key strategic concepts in chess, because whoever who controls the center, he controls more opportunities at the board. And right now in the center, there is a sort of tension. Uh, since black has uh, no double pawns, he wants to put the knight on e6 and start pushing his pawns, of course. So white's idea will be to try to prevent that, and also use his own pawn majority here to try to develop sort of an attack. But it won't be easy. So the idea for white is to stop the advance of the black pawns. How to do it? How to to do that? So Anatoly came up with just a simple move a3. <coughs> and basically, he just wants to block everything from the dark squares. And, or at the very least, simply to just join black pawns. After c prevent c5, play b4, and if c5 then takes, and this will be an isolated pawn. And because this pawn is alone in the center, and white will have pressure, white will be much better. So, um, I had to admit, you know, he was. Uh, he really well um, met uh, our uh, opening idea, and uh, I was really impressed. So the question is now what to do with this bishop. Because I cannot play b4, it will uh, leave everything hanging, and I have to put the bishop somewhere. I put the bishop on b7, because it's a safe spot. It also protecting, and of course I'm looking forward to d4, c5, and maybe changing the bishop. However, it's not quite so easy because whenever I play something like knight e6, it will just uh, fall under the uh, advance of the f1. And then, of course, once the pawn gets to f6, it will open my king, and then the black will be really in trouble. So I had to think of uh, something, and uh, knight a4, a tempo. So he attacks me, I counterattack him, so it's like a war of the tempies. You know, Dr. Tarash always said that the knight on the ring is a bad piece, which is like a basic canon in chess. But in this particular situation, we can also note from the Queen's uh, Gambit, uh, Carlsbad variations, sometimes black puts the structure like this. And then the idea is to put the knight on c4. Sort of, um, you know, uh, annulling the weaknesses of the position. And. Uh, White can give up the bishop, of course. A5. So, um, the position uh, drastically changed. Now White has a block on the queen side. But at the same point, uh, this pawn is kind of weak. So White doesn't have really time to use uh, um, this uh, for his advantage. So Anatoly played queen b3. Nice move for, you know, uh, protecting everything. Also, queen i is uh, here. And uh, I play queen following the plan, putting the knight on c4. So here we repeat it once to win time, because even if you have a lot of time, you know, the when you're meeting a new position for, for the first time and you're not sure what to do, you spend a lot of time even for all these things. So here, uh, also the second purpose of uh, you know repeating the position is always to check the intentions of your opponent. Does he want to play for a win, or he is uh, ready to repeat? It's a nice psychological weapon in a way. Okay, so centralizing the piece, I the, um, the X-ray, C4, and again. As you can see now, the knight is a really pretty piece. It hides uh, a lot of things on the board. And now I has to decide what to do with this knight. 
So that's why the master strategist decides to put the knight his of his own on c5, because that's an obvious uh, hole in the black's position. And the rook goes back to the open a line. It will be open to contest it. Knight e3 moves along the plan, and we has to find a home also to avoid the, the potential e4 and all the um, attacks. At the same time, also eyeing the spawn. Uh, the second idea behind this move is also sometimes when white plays knight c5, which he did in this case, uh, black can will be able to take here, and then of course bishop cannot take because pawn falls, but which results in white taking with the pawn, and then black will have a pass pawn here. But at the moment I cannot do it, and um, also black is kind of cramped, as you can see. It's very really tough to find any plan, white for white. May I say something? Yes. When you take on c5, when yes. the bishop uh, takes the rook. Yes, but I mean eventually. It's one of the ideas. I'm just showing you the ideas of the position so you can be clear on what's going on in general here. Um, so usually what black also does is uh, sometimes puts the pressure on the spawn and tries to undermine it uh, with f6. But in this case, it won't be so simple. Um, just to give you a general idea, I'm not talking about the forks or anything, just the uh, positional mechanics. In this case, white will play e4, and then will force the exchange here. And, and in this case, you can see clearly the difference between the bishops, this one and this one. Plus the weakness, of course. So uh, that's what white wants. He wants to play e4 to get this kind of position. The second plan, of course, is you know, once he blocked the queen side, is to start pushing the pawns here, g4, f4, f5, and then eventually create threats to the king. So black is actually forced to do something here. <coughs> And um, as you mentioned, I cannot take on c5 right now because bishop takes uh, attacks the rook. I have to move the rook. Uh, first, I have to put the bishop on c8 to take control over the e6 f5 squares, plus putting the bishop on a more useful spot. And of course, the second idea, if he wants to play something like e4 here, then it means that the bishop can uh, always come out this way and hit the rook from this side trying to provoke a 3 because uh, any movement from the king will still uh, weaken uh, white's king position. And of course, uh, in case of e4, black can just play bishop e6 in a way. Because this is a great knight. He doesn't want to take here. This is a lousy bishop, right? So what Anatoly did, he, he saw this, of course. So he played h3. A nice prophylactic, a move to the king, taking the square g4 from the bishop. And he is also ready to meet any bishop f5 with g4. You know, moves like this, and they identify a great positional player, of course. So, I have to play rook d8 to move the rook out of the way. And now, white was also, uh, it's not so simple for white to play as well. Because if you play f4 too early, then I can probably just take here and move the bishop on the light squares here. Because now the bishop has a new home on e4. So, and white is prevented from playing e4 himself. So it's not so simple because. Uh, So, I mean, the position can look really like nothing special, but at the same time, it can hold a lot of hidden intricacies. Um, and it's only just by g4 for, for that same reason, to prevent the bishop come to f5. And of course, uh, what to do? And we just spoke about it earlier. I decided to take on b4 first, because uh, if I take on c5 immediately, why take to the pawn? This pawn will not be uh, passed on, so it was necessary to take here first. Okay. 
Okay, I'll give him a line, but... And take on C5. So, if he takes, of course, I take on E4. So here's a, a change in the position. White now has two bishops. It has a beautiful, beautiful bishop on D4. And uh, it seems he has everything under control. However, despite the fact that the black's position is kind of passive, he has uh, trumps of his, of his own. Knight is strong. Bishop has no moves, but this is for, for now. There is a long-term positional possibility of the pass pawn. And um, any idea of now playing e4 creates a risk. Because suddenly, this beautiful bishop can be under attack. It could be something like h5 here, then queen d7, and there is also no attack for white. So, but if white doesn't play e4, what is he going to do with this bishop? Because uh, his bishop is also closed. Okay, but in the, mean, in, in the meantime, white controls the line. And... Um, the chess laws, they say that whoever controls the only open line has an advantage. So in this case, that's one of the reasons why I played bishop b7. My idea is, you know, the bishop is stupid, but the main idea is to put the rook, to change the pair of rooks, and then the factor of the past pawn will be much higher, of course, because white will always have to control it. So. Anatoly was short of time, and he decided to play some general moves, like strengthening his position and improving his bad bishop now. So he wants to put the bishop here, this diagonal. It will be also controlling the square of the promotion. It will be controlling the square of five, and looking at my king. Multi-purpose move. So every, each one of us goes according to his own plan. And he plays bishop f1. And now I'm following my plan. I just want to get into the end game where I will have a pass pawn which will give me counterplay at the very least. And for that reason, of course, I have to exchange queens because his queen was way more active. So it took. And suddenly, black's position doesn't look so bad anymore. No. No. Are there other ways to exchange? What? Are there other ways to exchange? Um, First bishop or something, is that possible? Yeah, but uh, see, mm -hmm. practically, white thinks that because he has two bishops, oh, okay. he is still better. He's not thinking about in terms of uh, whether he is uh, worse. He still okay. thinks he's better. But also, if he gives away the bishop, he's going to be worse, and that's it. Uh, uh, that's it. Yes. So, I mean, still, if you. If you, if you look at any endgame, two bishops are considered to be stronger piece than the knight and the bishop, always. But the, but the whole point is that uh, the pawns are on the white square, <coughs> and he has more space, but he, there is no way for him to get there. Plus, this is still a semi-closed position. And in this position, the knight is a good piece, of course. And I have a pass pawn. So at this point, I was really optimistic, and he was short of time. He was thinking he's still better. But as a black, I'm already realizing, you know, that it's time to play for a win. And uh, looking at his uh, clock, I was really happy. And uh, he continues to play his normal moves. And, of course, right before the same month, it's important to create some pressure on the opponent. This is one of those moves before he realizes what's wrong and puts the bishop here somewhere. Okay, so. He does what uh, everybody thinks is right, you know, expanding to bishops. Knight c4, the idea of, you know, getting the bishop into the game. Uh, and defense. And of course now there is no point in quitting the bishop because he's simply going to hit the pawn. So what I'm going to do, I was also getting short on time. Because so White still wants to expand here, create some, some sort of a pass pawn, which will be dangerous. So I played bishop c8 here first. Also, one of the threats, potential threats, is you know, to undermine the um, 
bone structure and try to get some blockade on the y square, some g 6 f 5 or something. Potential, I'm not saying. And also, the bishop will be a better place on d7, protecting and controlling this diagonal. There is no way for white to get to this pawn right now. Because, uh, okay, so, king of two, normal moves, right? Ah, sorry. He played f5. Again, expansion. So basically, white wants just to get his king here, play e4, force black to exchange, and then create some sort of weakness and open up the position of his bishops. But, sorry, I do too. Just controlling the square. I mean, we played this in 96 with no computers back then. I mean, they were like, but they were really weak. I used to beat the computer even the three minute chess. Maybe some of you will remember like programs named Chess Genius or something like that. We were using those. Uh, and, you know, looking at the game after many years, I realized, you know, we still played really decent chess. I mean, because people use general principles, they use the understanding, and um, oftentimes the computers, they still don't get it. Okay, G6. The start of the undermining process. If bishop goes to C2, knight can always cut him off with knight 4 and then white would have to resolve the structure anyway. So he uses tactics to get king to f4 to protect the pawn while that pawn is hanging. And I had to bring the king here just in case to protect my own uh, squares to get the promotion control. So king is 7. And in this position, the computer evaluates it as about uh, point 12, 13, which is basically even position. Um, but a little bit better for white because, again, white has no plan. Black cannot move anything because he'll be hit, uh, but uh, again, white was thinking he's better. He has to win, and uh, that was his problem. Now, he, you know, he achieved everything he ever wanted. You know, he got the active king, he got the center, he got the expansion, he got the bishops. And the question is, if you want to win this position, how are you going to win this? And he thought that by the sacrifice, he might uh, get the pass pawn of his own, protect it, and then get his king into that way. And that's what he did. Of course, uh, it was a miscalculation since he realized king e5 can be met by an c4 check. And so suddenly he started playing for a draw. You know, everybody goes back, take away the squares. And now I have set him up a nice trap. And I still remember, I mean, it was in the back in 96, almost 20 years ago. I still remember how he was, um, at this point, he had like about a minute left or something. I'm not sure we used the Fisher clock at the time, but probably we did. <coughs> and he was just about to take this pawn. <coughs> and of course, you cannot take this pawn. He clearly played this. But you cannot take this pawn because this bishop he holds the pawn, so it is important to you. Yes, but that's the whole point. If you don't see it, anybody who plays French will realize that this bishop will be changed with this maneuver, and then while white king goes after this pawn. Black will go after this pawn. And he will be right behind the white king. So that means white is lost. He's a pawn, he's a pawn down too. So, and I think Anatoly didn't say it because he was really scared. But his intuition, his intuition served him well. Basically, he realized that all he has to do is 
forced me to exchange this knight for this bishop. And then because of this pawn, king is always stuck protecting the square. And white has only really to play just one move here to completely cement the position and start chasing my knight to exchange him and then make a draw. Uh, and this was actually move number 49. I'm not sure why. I don't remember the time control, but, I'm sure. but I remember this time he was short, short of time. Maybe it was time for the second time control or something. So how, how do I prevent that and get actually here? So I played b2 and I b3. I wanted to dislocate the bishop from the square and at the cost of my powerful pawn, but now I want to, to get one of those. And uh, this was, of course, sorry, an easy move, followed by bishop c2. But he was so nervous. Or he saw a very interesting idea. What he did, he played this. Hey. Oops, sorry. And e4. I mean, this game features a lot of pawn movements, a lot of changing in structure. I and mean, this was. To me, because I'm a classical race, the chess player, to me it was really interesting, all these uh, perturbations. And now he has this fantastic uh, another. He sacrificed one pawn, and he just gives another pawn. Only to, you know, disjoin, to, to crush the black structure. And uh, if you ask the computer, the computer will tell you that white Black has a huge advantage, like minus one something. In practical terms, it's uh, really difficult. And after I took here, I can say it was a draw, because I have a lot of pawns, but there is no end. So the only question was if this move would be better try. The idea is to put the bishop on the line to work and put the knight on d7, hitting the pawn on f6 to work. Uh, and of course, white uh, has a lot of uh, move here. If you take, then take, and knight goes to f6 and swing, of course. But the problem is if he plays e5, because so. Uh, Again, white wants to transfer the game to the opposite color bishop's end game. So bishop a6. And the idea, of course, is to put the knight here and push the pawns here. So white has some interesting ideas like bishop a3. So he can put the bishop on the more active spot than here. And you see five, then of course bishop can hit the knight also. So if you want to prevent that, you have to play bishop e5. And king can just come like here. And this and this was a critical position. Um, I think that's the only time where I had some real chances uh, you know, to try to win the game. But um, you know, I'm not going to go into different lines because I don't quite remember them. But uh, after looking at this position for a while, white uh, has uh, very good defensive resources. You know, it's not so simple. Because the moment you push your pawn, the king blocks it, and then uh, very tough to move the knight, especially with this strong pawn here. In a lot of positions, what you get is something like, uh, uh, how to say this? OK, black gives up this two pawns. OK, I can just show in general what I can get. And we get something like, like this. And this is an extremely interesting, of course, because you get the point here somewhere. But of course, it's still a draw. I mean, OK, I'm going too far. <laughs>
but uh, during the game, of course, it's difficult when somebody offers you material and you have no idea why. You just decide to take it just to be cautious enough. <coughs> and that's what I did. And uh, I thought, I'm going to win this pawn anyway, because my knight is going to come and pick up this pawn as well. still playing. This is still the first game. And um, it seems that after I take this pawn, I'll have two extra pawns. But now, the true power of two bishops comes into play. I mean, uh, he can basically afford just to stand around. I thought that I can improve my bishop first before getting this pawn. So, and he just shuffled around. My bishop sort of, you know, but bishop c4, and I want to put him on the center. So he annoys me with his attacks here. Bishop d5 and bishop e2. Right, and this was another critical moment. I mean, black improved his position to the maximum. He got centralized bishop, got centralized knight. <coughs> And one of the interesting moves here to play for a win was c4. And you know, I'll just use the bishop. And the idea is to put the knight here, under the protection of the knight, put the pawn here, take, and just, you know, come out. But it's not so simple because, um, okay, either king d3 or bishop b 2 and the idea is if you play something like this, you can simply play king e3, with e5, and just bishop f3 or something like that. Because if you take, oh, give me a second, try to remember. side from the position that I play and it looks different of course. Um, so you take the pawn of e5 and then play king d4? What? Take the pawn of e5 and play king d4? Um yeah. The, 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 I, I, I'm trying just to remember how it was. Well definitely bishop b2 because you know he hits the pawn. If you play bishop c1, there's this trick, and black is like being really happy, and this is a mistake, of course, because now you can never get rid of this uh, pin. However, black will just simply play king g6, and he will delay taking the pawn until the knight moves at least. That's one interesting consideration. Okay, but bishop b2, knight c6. Just trying to remember what um, you know, one of the defensive major reasons was because he put the bishop on f3. Or maybe even here. And to prevent e5 from coming. Uh, okay, let's try to think strategically here. So if I play king e3, e5, bishop f3, he's taking. Ah, yeah, okay. King d4. Right, you were right. And black has two extra pawns, but surprisingly, there is no win. Because everything is controlled. This pawn is weak, and if I play king d6, he just attacks this pawn. And it's a draw. So, what can you do? So that's the reason why C4 didn't work. I play 
is safe. Exchange the pawns. 
So I have two pawns. But this is a draw because his king is also near. And he just plays on the black squares. That's why his bishop is strong. And we played for some moves, moves, and it's still a draw. But the effect of this game was terrible because, you know, I felt that I had this great opportunity. I was uh, minus three in the match, I was playing with black. If I had won this game, then, you know, he would be in shock for the next game, and I would be white, it's possible that I could win. And that would have meant I would be like plus one, and then we would have five more games, I would have a fighting chance. Uh, after this draw, you know, if you have two extra pawns, you know, you, you can win the game, it's really depressing. So the next game I played, it was with white, I lost. It was no fight. And that, and that was when the match was over. And I felt strongly that uh, during the game he was making horrible moves, you know, he allowed me to get two extra pawns. And I felt that if there was no adjournment, there was a big possibility that I would have won this game. But the adjournment, he came, he was completely different now, of course. You know, he, was, he knew what to do, he knew it was a draw, but it was a quick draw. And that was the result of the adjournment of my career. <laughs> <laughs> And then you stop. Uh, yeah, then I stop. But okay, that's completely different. To do with it. So yeah. many years later, when Emil came to me and told me, I got it. We are thinking about making a tournament with the old time control with the Germans. What do you like to play? And I remember this game. <laughs> and I said, you know, to hell with it. Okay, let's play. <laughs> Because after all, you know, it's not uh, just about uh, you. Chess is uh, about uh, everything. I mean, when you play time control like this, you remember the games from two centuries ago when the old grand uh, masters like Rubinstein and uh, Capablanca and Vasquez, they were playing on the old clocks. They were playing uh, simple time controls, thinking, you know, I think it's a great tradition still, you know. You feel yourself a bit closer, you feel like um, you're part of it. So it's nice to play again, something like that. And when you play field control, rapid chess, this is more about sport. And when you play with this time control, you remember all those times and you feel yourself less of a sport and you think of yourself more as intellectual.